But today we're going to finish our study through the book of Galatians. How many of you have enjoyed that, the study? Amen? Isn't God's Word, it, it's what we need. It's what we all need. And how can we study the Word of God and, and walk away disappointed? It brings life. It brings correction. And so we've been in the book of Galatians, and we've been discovering the gospel, the whole gospel, and nothing but the gospel. So help us God. It's what we need. It's what everybody needs. But today I'm going to start the message this way. I'm going to start the message with a who am I challenge. So I'm going to give a quote, kind of a lengthy quote, and I'm believing by, by the end of this quote, you're going to be able to say, who am I? Who, who is this who said these words? Are you ready for this? Here it goes. In high school, I boasted weekly, if not daily, that one day I was going to be the heavyweight champion of the world. As part of my boxing training, I would run down 4th Street in downtown Louisville, darting in and out of local shops, taking just enough time to tell them I was training for the Olympics and I was going to win a gold medal. And when I came back home, I was going to turn pro and then become the world heavyweight champion in boxing. I never thought of the possibility of failing, only of the fame and the glory I was going to get when I won. I could see it. I could almost feel it. When I proclaimed that, that I was the greatest of all time, I believed in myself. And I still do. Who am I? There you go. You got it. You guessed it. It's Muhammad Ali. And this is a quote from, it's an excerpt, a quote from an article titled, I am still the greatest. <laughs> and now I'll tell you this. Many, if not most people, would say that Muhammad Ali was the greatest boxer of all time. But this is something else we know about Muhammad Ali. He was probably one of the greatest boasters of all time. In fact, way back in 1963, near the beginning of his career, um, he, he actually did a spoken word album. And guess what the title of the album was? I am the greatest. I am the greatest. <laughs> I am the greatest. Today we're going to read the final words. Final encouragement, final warnings, the final blessings from the Apostle Paul to the church in Galatia. And the title of today's message is this, Who's the Greatest? Who's the Greatest? You see, you already know the answer. We're done. Let's close in prayer. All right. Y'all got This is the advanced study group right here. All right. Diving in Galatians chapter 6, verse 11. Apostle Paul says, see what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Now, let me just stop there. That's just an interesting statement right there near the end of this letter. And some would say that this statement's an indication that Paul's thorn in the flesh was poor eyesight. Maybe. I don't know. Um, some say that. You know, it's one of those kind of things. But others say, and, and I would tend to agree that we can, we can definitely see this, that that Paul is wanting to end this letter with a personal touch. As he's ending, he's saying, say, look, look, I'm going to actually write this last part, not just dictate it, but I'm actually going to write with my own hand these final words because I want to make sure that you get this and that you understand just how important this message is to you. And he says this in verse 12. Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh, are trying to compel you to be circumcised. So here we are. It's like Paul's going back to the very beginning. What did, what did he say in the beginning of the book? Who was he criticizing? Who was he warning the church about? Those who were trying to get believers, those saved by the grace of Jesus, saved by the work of Christ alone, Trying to get these believers, these Judaizers, these circumcision group folks, were trying to get the church to go back into the works of the law in order to be saved, in order to be in right relationship with God. And so Paul's ending the letter, making sure, I'm going to go back to that whole thing about circumcision. I'm going to go back and I'm going to point out these, these guys who are messing around with you, beware. Beware. And we need to beware of any works-oriented gospel messages out there. 
any kind of message, any kind of message that says, you need to do this in order to be saved. You need to do that in order to be saved. You need to look like this. You need to talk like this. You need to pray like this in order to be saved. There is only one thing and one thing alone that saves, and that is the work of Jesus Christ, period. You and I, we brought nothing to the table, zero. All we had, filthy rags. Falling short. It is only the work of Jesus that saves. And now we're going to see as we continue in here though, that when we've been saved, when we've been made new by the grace of Jesus, then things change. And we start talking different, thinking different, and acting different. It's pretty amazing. Because when God does something it has a pretty big effect. And I believe that we can have testimonies in and throughout this room about that, about just the big effect that Christ has had in your lives. So those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. And Paul says the only reason that they're doing this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. So in the end, these religious folks who are trying to put hoops out there for you to jump through again in order to please God, they're not even doing it to please God. They're doing this in order to protect their own reputations. Point number one, don't be an undercover Christian. Don't be an undercover Christian. There are, there are a lot of undercover Christians in the world today, a lot of them. They call themselves a Christian, but, but they shy away from ever talking about and sharing the very truth, the very good news that actually saved them. To me, that's an undercover Christian. Man, when you're around other Christians, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. When it's cool, man, I, I got the cross. I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. But when there are lost in the room, it's like crickets. Where's the gospel? Where's the good news? Where, where's, where's the truth that actually saved you? Where is that? I don't know, man. I don't know. Shying away from sharing the very truth that saved us. That's, that's an undercover Christian in my view. The gospel of Jesus Christ. And so these, these Judaizers were just like that. They, they wanted to be, avoid being persecuted for the cross. And so what did they do? They, they changed the message of the gospel. They, they watered it down. They sanitized it. They made it fit better into the world. Why? So that they wouldn't be persecuted. They wouldn't be embarrassed. They wouldn't be excluded from the country club Christian gatherings, whatever you want to call it. And we see this happening today. We talked about this many, many messages ago, early on in our study. The different gospels that are out there. Where they, they start with the gospel, but then they water it down. They change it. Like you got the social gospels that are out there. The woke gospels that are out there. It's all about creating a gospel that is world-friendly, that fits in so that, so that they'll be accepted. You've got... The health and wealth gospel, that's another one. It sounds good. It gets people excited. Oh, I want that. I want money and all that stuff. The one that we're seeing all over the place right now, and maybe you're going to hear this and go, what? This is real? No, this is happening like crazy right now. They're, the gospel is being perverted and packaged in order to be LGBTQ friendly. And we've seen it over the, over the last decade or more with some of the more liberal groups and churches out there that have gone that direction. But it is all out of salt right now on the gospel. There is so much pressure for the church to modify truth in order to be LGBTQ friendly. 
And when we do that, we have thrown out the gospel. Oh, we won't be persecuted. Yeah, but we won't be God's ambassadors anymore either. We will be useless. And anything we do and say from there, burnt up. Burnt up. Now, when Paul says the cross of Christ, he's talking about the message of Jesus. He's referring to the preaching of the gospel of Jesus. Because the gospel is all about the cross. It's all about what Jesus did on the cross. Taking upon himself our sins. The cross is the fundamental truth of the good news of Jesus. And that good news is that he atones for the sins of sinners. By his substitutionary death on the cross. That's the cross of Christ. That's the gospel of Jesus. The good news of the cross is the truth that Jesus receives from God the wages of our sin, which is death. And in return, for all who believe by faith, who believe in Christ, we receive from Christ what he actually merited, which is eternal life. That's the message of the cross of Jesus. That's the gospel of Jesus. That's the good news. That's the great exchange. And I hope one thing that we've discovered in our study through the book of Galatians is that foundational truth that governs the apostle is the cross of Christ. And it needs to be the foundational truth that our lives are not just standing on, but that we're springboarding off of that into the world and bringing that to others. The gospel of Jesus, the cross of Christ. So I was just in Texas. Um, I was over there, I I mentioned earlier in our time of Thanksgiving, and um, thank you, so many of you have been praying for me, really praying for my dad, and we went on Thursday to the advanced heart failure specialist, and I'm going to tell you what, I felt God's grace all over that, and God led us to the right person. He actually changed the doctor who was supposed to be there to somebody else. And I know that was God's hand. God is moving. He's answering prayers. And I believe he's making a way for my dad. I really do. But I was in Texas. That's, let me get back to the point. I was in Texas. So keep praying for my dad, by the way. Keep praying for him. I, I was in Texas, though. I used to live in Texas. How many of you know that? So sometimes I say, y'all, and and if I'm ever around a Texan, if you're a Texan and I'm ever around you, I'm going to start talking like a Texan again and, and getting a little, you know, twang going back and all that kind of stuff. And if I get really crazy, I'll put my cowboy boots back on and so on and so forth. But anyway, so I was in Texas, and this is what they say in Texas. You see this if you're driving down the highway. Don't mess with Texas. Don't mess with Texas. And, and really, the context of it is, Don't be throwing your litter and your trash all around Texas, okay? You keep all that stuff to yourself. Don't mess with Texas. Here's Paul's version of that. Don't mess with the gospel. That's the book of Galatians. You want to know the book? What's the book of Galatians about? Don't mess with the gospel. Don't mess with it. Don't be littering the gospel with all your trashy thoughts of how you can make it better and make it go down easier and this and that and this. Don't don't mess with the gospel of Jesus. Don't litter that way. So really, as we look at our lives, you know, we're called to share the gospel. You're called to be sharing the gospel with others. Well, I just do it by the way I act. Okay, that's like, you know, what two-year-olds can do. But I'm just saying, you know, you're going to grow up, right? you got a mouth now. You you can speak. You you have a vocabulary. And God's given you that for a purpose, to glorify Him, right? And to to spread His good news. So, I mean, I'm challenging you in a little bit right now. is, Is we all are called to share the gospel with others. My question is, is... Are you sharing the gospel, the whole gospel, and nothing but the gospel with others? Or are you undercover, laying low, wanting it to fit in? 
or even littering it with, with your own rendition of it that you think is going to work for your neighbor better than what Jesus, what his word has given us to share. You know, after I preach, people will say, man, pastor, that was a good message. And so it, I appreciate that. I appreciate it. But I'm going to tell you what. The only good anybody ever gets out of anything I say up here from this pulpit is the Word of God. That's it. That's it. My little stories, oh, let's start with who am I? Muhammad Ali, okay, that's cute. That's good. That can kind of tie some things in, kind of bring us in so that we'll listen and all that kind of stuff. But the only thing that changes any of our lives is this right here, is the Word of God. That's what comes and separates. That's, that's what has its effect in our lives. All the other stuff is just little stuff that we kind of, because you all need, we're attention deficit. I don't know what it is. We just, we're Americans. We're over, ah, we need, we need to make it interesting. Wow, this is it, man. Read it. It's pretty, pretty interesting. It's crazy. It's wild. It's off the charts. But anyway, what people need from us in this wilderness of a world that we live in, is this, is the gospel, what Christ has done for them, the length that he went to, what he took upon himself. That's what people need to hear. Paul says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it, what? The gospel. Not anything else, but what? Because it, the gospel, is the power of God that brings salvation. It's not, not, oh, well, you know, I, they like hanging out with me and eventually somehow salvation is just going to kind of just kind of ooze off of me or rub off of me onto them. And it's just, gonna, no, no, because it is the gospel. That is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And we read elsewhere in Scripture, how do they believe unless they hear? How are they going to hear unless somebody tells them? Well, who do you think it is that's called to tell them? It's you and me. It's us. And when they hear the gospel, and they believe, first the Jew. And then the Gentile. The world doesn't need any, undercover, any more undercover Christians. They don't need more woke, politically correct, sensitive Christians. And when I say sensitive, I don't mean unloving. You know what I'm saying? We need to be loving. We need to be the most loving people in the world. And sometimes we fail so miserably at that. Last week we read about how we're charged to restore gently and carry each other's burdens and to lay down our lives. And Jesus is the example of what love really looks like. Laying down our lives, our rights, our everything for others. But the world doesn't need a bunch of culturally, socially sensitive, shy away from being direct kind of Christians. We need to be those who in love and with the leading of the Holy Spirit and, and wisdom and, and God will give you just amazing ways and opportunities when you're willing to share this good news. You don't have to manufacture things, but you need to be ready, willing, and available. And then speak it. Oh, I don't know. Is it going to be right? Don't be an undercover Christian. Don't be ashamed. Don't avoid don't litter the gospel. Anyway, we got to move on here. So, a lot of people avoid confrontation and discomfort. You know, I'm a, people look at me and they often think, man, he's, he can handle anything. He, he, must, he just loves a fight. Dude, I don't. To be honest with you, I don't. I avoided so many fights when I was younger, like real fist fights. Um, hated it. And I don't really enjoy confrontation. I don't like it. But it's part of life. And I'm not going to avoid confrontation at the cost of the gospel or at the cost of just doing what's right. Confrontation is worth it at that point in time. A lot of people avoid confrontation. They have discomfort in that. But a lot of times those same people are really good at boasting and bragging 
about their personal wins and, and works and how they're all that in a bag of chips, you know. And so that brings us to point number two. Be careful in your boasting. Be careful in your boasting. So don't be an undercover Christian and be careful in your boasting. Here we go, verse 13, Paul continues. He says, and this is in his own hand, in his own, own writing, big letters. So I'm going to yell this out because it's, no, I'm not. <laughs> verse 13, not even those who are circumcised keep the law. Yet, they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. See, look at all these people we get to follow us. See, we're still the real leaders around here. Anyway, verse 14, Paul says, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So that brings us back to Muhammad Ali. Are we more like Paul or are we more like Muhammad Ali? Are you boasting in what you've done and who you are? Or is your boasting reserved for another? Is your boasting reserved for Jesus? What He and He alone has done for you. A.W. Pink, he was an English Bible teacher. He once said this, quote, he says that the greatest mistake made by people is hoping to discover in themselves that which is to be found in Christ alone. So what does cross-centered boasting look like? Where does it come from? Well, cross-centered boasting comes from accepting, first of all, how we look on the inside. When we get real with ourselves, when you really look at what's inside, specifically what was inside before Christ made it new. When you go back and look at the condition of you, B.C., before Christ, and you're sincere about that, you realize, I have nothing to boast about in myself. But I have everything to boast about in the cross of Jesus. For look what he has done. Look what he has done. Cross-centered boasting is about living for an audience of one. When we're living for Jesus, when we're living for God, when he's our audience, when he's the one that we long to please and worship and adore, when it's his applause, not because, oh, look at how great you are, Jimmy, but when it's his applause that, that we seek and his alone, That's when we find ourselves in that position where we're not boasting in ourselves, but we're boasting in Christ, the cross of Jesus. So again, this church in Galatia was being drawn back into the mindset of, what can I do? What can I do for God? How can I add to what Jesus has done for me? We need to boast in Christ alone. I said it earlier. Everything we bring to the table is just filthy rags, and I'm not going to describe what that is. If you don't know, ask the person next to you. Or maybe not. So let's go back to that question. Who's the greatest? I mean, really, in your life, who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? It's easy for, for me to slip back into that answer. Who's the greatest? Well, I'm, I just, I mean, the world tells us, man, you need to take care of yourself. You need to really think awesome of yourself. And I'm not talking about you just think you're worthless because here's the deal. We need to think about ourselves the way God thinks about us. You know, God loves us. You know, he, he loves us so much that, that through his son, Jesus, as we believe by faith, that he actually brings us who were his enemies into his family, he adopts us as sons 
and daughters. He calls us friend. He calls us family. He calls us child. He calls us beloved. He becomes jealous for us, like a, a holy jealousy. He loves us so much he's coming back to be with us like mano a mano, flesh to flesh, you know, together, walking in the cool of the day like it was in the beginning. Who's the greatest? God is the greatest. We're going to go to point number three now. The only, the one thing that counts. The one thing that counts. So, City Slickers, Curly, you know the deal. We, we've probably talked about this. You know, do you know what the one se the secret in life is? And he holds up his finger. He says, you know. And so Mitch uh, goes, says, your finger, that's the one thing. That's the one thing in life. It's your finger. And then Curly responds, no, the one thing, just one thing. You need to, you need to find out what that is. You need to stick to that because the rest don't mean snot. Now, I, I censored that a little bit. So the rest don't mean snot. And Mitch says, but, but what is the one thing? And Curly, old Curly, just passed away over the last few years, actually, the actor did. But he, but he says, that's what you need to find out. You need to find out what is that one thing that matters. What is that one thing that matters? As Christians, we don't have to wonder what the one thing that matters is. In fact, this is what Paul has to say about this. Paul says in verse 15 that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. In other words, anything that's, that's on the outside, anything that you look like or do or interact, how, none of that kind of stuff. It's, it's none of that stuff. None of your works. None of that stuff matters. What counts, the one thing in other words, what counts is the new creation. What's the one thing? What counts, Paul says, at the end of this message about the gospel of Jesus and how we're called to respond to the gospel? What counts is the new creation, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God, which I believe he's speaking of the church in that case, to those who've been grafted in. Not all Israel is Israel, Scripture says. He's speaking about the Israel that comes through Christ Jesus in this case. But he says, what counts? What is the one thing in life that counts? The new creation. And you're like, great. What is that talking about? Well, Paul just told us that, that in the end, your outward works, your man-made rules, your religious preferences don't mean a dadgum thing, as they would say back where I grew up. What matters is what Christ has done in you. The new creation that you are in and because of Christ Jesus. That's what matters. What matters is not what you have done in, through, and because of you. What matters is what Christ has done in and through you. The new creation that you are in Christ Jesus. Do you know that if you're in Christ, you are a new creation? You can't make yourself new, but God can. And if you're in Christ, he has made you new. And that's what counts. Going back to Galatians 3.3, 3, jumping back a few chapters. Paul said to us, he said, are you so foolish? I could say it a different way, but we'll just go with Paul's way. Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit, by what God has done, the capital S, Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? And I think we all need to go back to that and ask ourselves that. Oh, we know what God has done, that he saved me. But are we taking the reins again and trying to finish now what God has started? Going back, though, to ourselves to do the finishing work. Don't do it. That's littering the gospel. Don't mess with the gospel. And don't mess with Texas. Because <laughs> the one thing that counts is what God has done. And what God is doing. And what God will do. Because he saved you in Christ Jesus. He is saving you. It's called sanctification. 
and he will save you. That's called glorification. All of his promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. What he started, he's faithful to complete. You don't need to step in there and give him a hand. You know what I'm saying? You just need to go along for the ride. And you need to allow this transformation to be real in your life. Because when it is, you'll see all kinds of things changing. Here's what it says in Scripture in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. So what's the one thing that counts? The new creation. How do we become the new creation? In Christ. So, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. Behold, the new has come. The one thing that counts. The new that Christ has done in you. The old is gone. The wretch has been made new. If you're in Christ Jesus, you are no longer a wretch. You were a wretch. He saved you. You're beautiful. You're, you're, you're new. You, you've been redeemed. Don't call yourself a wretch. You were a wretch. You can talk about it in the past tense. I was a wretch. I was messed up. I was messed up, lost, the worst of the worst, whatever you want to say about yourself in the past tense. But if God has made you new, you need to declare the truth of who God, what God has done, and, and what he has done in you. I'll just go ahead and say it. I believe when we refer to ourselves in the old nature, we are denigrating the work of Jesus that he's done in our lives. It's like, I give you a million bucks. You're like, I'm poor, I'm poor, I got no money, I got no money. Here's a million dollars. And you got a million dollars, and now you're living in this beautiful home. You're driving this nice car, and you're doing that. And you're still driving around and telling everybody, I'm just poor, man. I don't got nothing, man. And, and, and I'm, I'm listening and watching you say this. I'm like, who, what are you talking about? You, you don't even, the gift I gave you has no account, no value, no nothing. Well, think about what Christ has done for us. The work that he has done in and through our lives. If we believe and, and, and appreciate what that work is, what that gift is, then we need to declare it. Because when we declare it, we will then live it. That's why it's important what we speak. When I was with my dad, I didn't speak death, I speak life. When you're parenting your children, you speak life over them. Speak blessing over them, not curses. The old is gone. You're new. And it's not just a legal status. You are born again. This is born again reality. Do we understand that? We are born again. When a child is born, it's just not a declaration. That's a person. That's a fully formed body, soul, spirit, creation, all-encompassing. When we are a new creation in Christ, it's a full deal, man. Body, soul, spirit. He has made us new. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. We got to be careful, man, that we don't just talk about things from a academic perspective. God came to save people. Not to make a point. Or create a doctrine. He came to save people. You and me. And when we're in Christ, we are new creations. Scripture refers to us as born again. The old, gone. That's past tense. Don't talk about any of that present tense. Behold, the new has come. Who's the greatest? Jesus, the one who's made you new. The one who's made you new. And I want to just say this. When you're new in Christ, you're going to find yourself, like I said earlier, you're going to find yourself thinking differently. Because we're new creations, and so we, we think differently now. 
We think God's way. You know, that's what repentance is. It begins with thinking differently. And God renews our mind. You've read that in Scripture, haven't you? He renews our mind. And we're called to continue to have our mind renewed and be conformed to His likeness and transformed by His Word, by truth. And when we think differently and we understand our new identity and who we are now, all because of what Christ has done, we start acting differently. We start treating people differently. Because He makes all things new. And when God does something, He does a really good job at it. So when you become a new creation in Christ, He does a really good job at making you new. And my prayer is that you'll really receive that, ponder that, read about that, embrace who you are now in Christ. Speak that over your life. Live it out. Talk that way. Act that way now. The one thing that counts, the new creation. Point number four, Paul's closing remarks and blessing. Paul says in verse 17, From now on, let no one cause me trouble. <laughs> anyway, I think I've said that before too myself, but anyway. This dude dealt with a lot, okay? He says, From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Paul had been beaten. This man had been beaten, torn up, He'd been left for dead several times because he was somebody who would preach the gospel, the whole gospel, and nothing but the gospel. Paul's ministry was in question because of the religious Judaizers. They were coming in behind him, and they were, they were littering the gospel and changing it. And, and, and saying that, that dude, Paul, he, he, didn't, he didn't have the full thing. He didn't really know all that he was talking about. Let us tell you what it is and let us bring you back to reality here. And, and Paul's having to deal with all this mess, all these accusations, all this trash and garbage being thrown at him personally and being thrown at the gospel that Jesus gave him to preach. Paul is having to deal with all of that, yet he doesn't give up. But he's a man. He said, it'd be great if it would stop. I'm paraphrasing. Because I got a lot of scars. Physical, and you know others too. And then he ends with this. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. So here's how I want to end. I want to invite you to stand up. And I just feel that I'm supposed to pray that over us right now. Pray that blessing over us, the church, the body of Christ. Those who are, are benefiting from this gospel that Paul presented and defended and reminded us of here in this letter. So if you're comfortable and you want to just stretch out your arms, just... As a sign of, of just surrender to the Lord and that He's the greatest and, and just to receive from Him even now. Lord, we come before You, God, and we recognize that You and You alone, I mean, there's nothing even close, nothing, 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 that You are the greatest. You are the greatest. And Lord, I just even now pray over this congregation of believers here. Your grace, that the grace of Jesus Christ, that we would walk in that grace every day, that that grace of Jesus, that power of God that has made all things new in us, God, that every single one of us here today and watching online and listening even right now, God, would grab hold of what you've grabbed hold of for us, that we would embrace the fact that we have been made new by your grace, by your power, by your goodness, your love, and your mercy. God, we declare even right now our hands raised saying that you are supernatural and that you are able to do above, beyond what we can ever think, hope, and even imagine. And we trust, God, that what you've done has been done. 
that we don't need to add to it, but we can just walk in it, embrace it. Trust what you've done. God, we thank you for your grace that has brought us salvation. God, and I thank you that your grace, as it says in Titus 2, 11, that that same grace that saved us is also teaching us, empowering us, is leading us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. God, that, that your grace is teaching us how to live as new creations, to say no to what we need to say no to, to say yes to what we need to say yes to, to walk out of condemnation and fear and to walk into the calling and the anointing that you have on each one of us as your people, as your church. Even now, I just pray that fear, any kind of fear or wrong thinking, thinking less than about, about ourselves would be broken off of us right now. That we would walk in the truth of who we are in Christ Jesus. That we would walk in the confidence that it's not us that's showing up, but it's you that's showing up when we bring the gospel. And we don't have to rely on our own strength, but we can watch you do what you do. Lord, I thank you that it's not by might nor power, but it's by your Spirit. And Lord, I ask that each one of us, with our hands raised, would just be those who walk by the Spirit day by day. No striving. Saying no to the flesh, yes. Embracing you. What you've done and what you're doing. Lord, I just thank you that we can be those people. That that's who we are. We're the redeemed of the Lord. We're the new creation. All because of you, Jesus. God, I ask that you be glorified in each one of our lives, even this week. And Lord, I pray that every single person who is a new creation would have a renewed appreciation for that, even this week. As we're in this Advent season, this week even right now of preparation, God, that we would have a renewed anticipation and expectation of what it means to be the new creation in Christ. Thank you for blessing your people. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. 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 Man, that's hard to not keep praying. I just want to keep praying and just keep